Welcome to another episode of Higher Learning. I am your host, Oz Rashid. Today, we have a very special guest, Will Barsoom. He's the President and Chief Transformation Officer at Healthcare Outcomes Performance Company, but previously was with the Cleveland Clinic for 25 years. I think the last eight years, you were President and CEO for Cleveland Clinic Florida. Is that correct, Will? Yeah, that's exactly right. Love it. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great, actually. Beautiful day here in South Florida. The sun's out. It's uh, nice and cool outside, so it doesn't get much better than this. I totally agree with you. I got to give you a lot of credit. You told me that you just traveled to like eight different cities in 10 days, and you look relaxed and tan and, <laughs> and good. When I get back from traveling to even one city, I feel like I just walked out of uh, you know, a death zone. So I got to give you a lot of credit for, for how refreshed and relaxed you look. Well, I'll tell you, there's a science to uh, to travel, especially transatlantic and transpacific travel. You got to figure out when you should go to sleep, when you should wake up and hold yourself to a tight schedule so that whenever you land, you're refreshed. That's the key. You know what? I am going to write this down. That is great tips right there. <laughs> travel tips. We didn't think we were going to get it on this podcast, but here we are. So, so Will, I wanted to ask you, let's start here. You were with the Cleveland Clinic, like we talked about, for 25 years, and you were CEO and president of the Cleveland Clinic Florida, I think, for the last eight. Obviously, one of the most renowned health care organizations we have in this country. And while you were there, the growth tripled in its size and you were leading it in Florida for a large part of that. I'm interested with so much time and tenure and success. Is there anything that stands out to you that you're most proud of in terms of your time there? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's a few things. Number one, um, I came to, to Florida after Cleveland Clinic Florida had been established 25 years before. And, you know, it was always a great organization in Florida, but but candidly struggled in the community, struggled getting, um, you know, the brand recognition that it deserved, uh, deserved, uh, struggled getting the growth the, that it deserved. Um, it was it was always a little bit of a stepchild to the to the overall Cleveland Clinic. And that was one thing that was important to me was was really playing a bigger role in the community for the organization. And through that role, uh, we found more and more demand growing. We built incredible transplant programs there for a relatively small hospital. Like you said, we we actually, we more than tripled, almost quadrupled the size of the organization while I was there. We had about 45 sites around Southeast Florida wow. uh, and we just kept growing. So I was very proud of that. When when COVID hit, um, our, our response to COVID was, was really best in class. I mean, we had the incredible support of our big brothers up north, uh, incredible organization and and really acted as a unit between Cleveland, Abu Dhabi, London, Florida, uh, to make sure that we were doing the right thing. So there was a lot, really a lot to be proud of with an organization like the Cleveland Clinic. That's really incredible. And, and now I'm curious, you know, obviously it's an established brand up in the Northeast. You're coming here, you're educating, obviously you're getting involved in the community, but are there things that you did differently here than what they did up at say the mothership that were more conducive to Florida and kind of building things in Florida from a regional perspective, or was it a similar playbook? Yeah, no, I mean, there's definitely differences. I mean, if you look in Cleveland, um, you know, the organization has the name of the city in its mm -hmm. name, right? I mean, it's called the Cleveland Clinic. Sure. So, um, and it's got a hundred year track record in Northeast Ohio. So it, it wasn't, it wasn't what it is today, 70 years ago. Right. It took 100 years to become the incredible organization that is that it is. It's taken you know, dozens of incredible leaders and and thousands upon thousands of, of great doctors and tens of thousands of great nurses and hundreds of thousands of great employees over time, caregivers, we call them at the Cleveland Clinic over time to make it what it is today. <laughs> in Florida, you know, it's a very different market. You know, Cleveland is a two healthcare system market. It's the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals. Um, Southeast. Florida is a is a market that has probably a dozen different healthcare systems. You've got yeah. nonprofits, you've got for profits, <clears throat> and uh, you've got large primary care groups that take full risk from Medicare. So you're competing in a very very different market um, than, than you are in Northeast Ohio. Even just from a reimbursement perspective, our reimbursements in Florida averaged. Uh, from the commercial payers, probably less than 50% of what we got up in Northeast Ohio. So oh, wow. real challenges from that perspective. So we had to build a healthcare system that was sustainable and truly delivered on value in terms of being able to deliver very high quality, low cost care. So Cleveland Clinic Florida is an organization that was actually break even at Medicare rates, which is almost unheard of throughout the United States. Most healthcare systems lose money yeah. uh, on Medicare. We were we were lean enough that we could break even. So 
you know, we were committed to the to the academic mission of the Cleveland Clinic, uh, to the to the to the uh, research, to the to the education, you know, all of those important parts of our mission. But clearly, most so to the outstanding clinical care. And and as an organization, I think we delivered on that very nicely. And I love that because, you know, you would think running leaner, that would leave something on the table for patient care. But we both know that's not the case. And when we were speaking that we have a shared passion for culture and then the impact that that has on the patients and bottom line alike. And so I'm interested, how, how have you personally seen the bottom line impact of a great organizational culture? And then I know that it was more formative and you were transforming that here in South, Southeast Florida. How did that change in your time there? Is there something tangible you can point to? It was like this internally. And then when we got to kind of that, that quadrupled size, it's now this in terms of the way people operate and just kind of the feeling and sense of the, of the caregivers within the organization. You know, there, there's, um, there's, there's what a lot of people call discretionary effort, right? I mean, you have a job, you've got a clear job description, you know what your job is and you deliver on that job, you do a good job and that's it, right? Punch it at nine o'clock, go home at five o'clock, you're done. Yep. <clears throat> the folks that are, that are really engaged, that love their organization, that give extra, right? It's that discretionary effort. It's the, the, the caregivers that you think about and you say, wow, that person really went above and beyond. So when you build a strong corporate culture, um, that discretionary effort becomes standard. I, I can tell you here at Hopco, where I am today, uh, I've never seen an organization where so many people work overtime every day, right? I mean, it's the discretionary effort. It's it's the sense of ownership. It's the sense of pride for, for what they've built and what they've done and what they've accomplished. I would tell you that that the name Cleveland Clinic for its caregivers embodies an organization that is committed to its community and, and thereby, you know, gives, each caregiver gives more discretionary effort, right? They see a patient walking down the hall that looks, that looks lost or a family member that looks lost, right? You can simply ask them, how can I help you? Say, so, well, I'm trying to get to this building. You can point them that direction, or you can say, why don't you follow me? I'll, I'll make sure that you get there safely. You know, that's the discretionary effort that I'm talking about. That's the difference between a good organization and a great organization. And, you know, places like the Cleveland Clinic, places like Hopco, you know, they develop that incredible reputation because of the discretionary effort of the caregivers that come to work there every day. I really love that terminology. I've actually never heard of it used as discretionary effort. And that really spreads across all different types of vocation, right? Chick-fil-A, they give discretionary effort, right? Four Seasons, they give discretionary effort. In healthcare, it's paramount that they give discretionary effort. And when I try to articulate what the difference is between the people that work at our company here at MSH and, and maybe some of the others is that a lot of those people are giving that discretionary effort. And listen, you have to be intentional about creating a culture and purpose and mission that people align with to get that. Because otherwise, it, it's not like I've seen people in one role in company not give discretionary effort. And then you put that exact same person in a completely different company and situation, and they are giving that discretionary effort. So it's not necessarily a lot of times we look at it as leaders as like, well, that person's not giving discretionary effort. And that's actually a character flaw of them. They're not some that's not something that individual is willing to do when really it's much more macro than that. And to me, it's so much more on the leadership and the environment and the culture that you build to be able to get that discretionary effort. I really love that. I'm definitely going to use that term going forward. So, yeah, so appreciate, appreciate you saying that. <laughs> Let's talk about the intentionality of that culture. Are there any programs that maybe you put in place at Hopco or at uh, Cleveland Clinic in, in South Florida that um, stand out to you that, especially that patient aspect, right? Because I'd like to think that everybody who gets into the healthcare space is very patient first and patient forward. But, you know, sometimes there's things that can get in the way in terms of the job, the task, the logistics, whatever, maybe bad day, good day. Are there intentional things that you put in place at either of these companies that really put that focus on the patients that you've saw, seen be super successful? Yeah, you know, I, I, I would tell you um, a lot of it is probably leadership training because as leaders, you have to, you have, to, you have to be the role models. You have to model the behavior that you want to see in the rest of the organization. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been very fortunate in that, you know, after my high school and college jobs where I worked for Cutco and I worked for The Gap, you know, <laughs> selling stuff, you know, every organization I've, I've worked for since then has been physician-led, whether it was the Cleveland Clinic, whether it was New England Baptist where I did my fellowship, now at Hopco or a physician-led organization. And, and one thing that we don't really learn in medical school is leadership, right? You don't learn how to run a company in medical school. Um, what, you, looking at both the Cleveland Clinic and Hopco, 
two things that, that they've done very successfully in both organization have been having a clear, consistent, transparent, focused uh, desire to elevate the quality of care that patients get for a simple reason, because patients deserve it. Mm. Right? That's, that's the only reason you need. That's number one. And number two, to be able to deliver on that consistently, they've put training programs in place for that next generation of clinical leaders. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when I, got, when I got to the Cleveland Clinic, when I came back on staff there after my training, Joe Hahn, uh, who was the uh, chief of surgery at the time, um, he was a neurosurgeon. Uh, he's retired now, but, but he reached out to me and he said, look, why don't you um, go through our surgery leadership training program? You've done a good job. You know, you've been here for a few years. You've caught the attention of some folks. We want you to learn. I said, sure, that'd be great. So the organization invested in me to take courses at Kellogg, to take courses at uh, Harvard School of Public Health, Harvard School of Business, uh, and put on our own internal training program where we learned about healthcare finance, healthcare strategy, healthcare compliance, healthcare quality, all of these things that you don't necessarily learn about in medical school. Uh, it allowed me to be better prepared as a future leader for the organization. So when I was asked to first become the chairman of surgical operations and then eventually to become the CEO and president of Cleveland Clinic Florida, it wasn't like I was plucked out of clinical practice and said, and told, you know, go for it, go lead the, this part of the organization with no background. I had had a lot of background because of the training, because of the investment that the organization had made in me. Hopco is no different. We've now put in place incredible leadership training programs. And each time somebody graduates from that program, they are by default kind of the next up for a promotion. So when an, when an opportunity comes up to lead part of the organization, somebody that has been in our training program, and they didn't get there obviously by, you know, through some fluke of nature, they got there because they were great at what they did and we saw them as future leaders, then they've trained for it, then it becomes a very easy decision to say, this is the next person that's going to, you know, climb the ladder at the organization. And, and, and again, the expectation is that you'll model the behavior of what you expect for the rest of the folks in your in, in, in your division. I really love that incredible foresight by both organizations. You talked a little bit about maybe more of the classical training that you got at some of the universities versus the one that's been built at Hopco internally, it sounds like. Do you have a preference either way? Are both effective? Is one more effective than another, in your opinion? Having yeah. seen both? You know, I, I think, look, I mean, the, the, the basics are the basics, right? It's like learning anatomy. If you want to be a surgeon, you have to first learn anatomy, right? Anatomy doesn't change from one, you know, from one uh, 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 medical school to the other. So you learn the basics, you learn kind of the, the foundation of what you need, and then you learn how to apply it. So an, or, an organization like Hopco, which is now the largest um, value-driven musculoskeletal management company in the country, mm. has a playbook. Right. But in many ways, that playbook has evolved over time because nobody else did musculoskeletal value based management uh, in the country. So you took the basics, you evolved those basics to apply them to what we're doing here at Hopco. Uh, and uh, and it works very well. So, you know, you, you want to learn the basics, but but the very best leaders are always evolving their style. They're evolving their their. Uh, their ultimate goals and they're evolving how you get there. You know, there are certain things that, that, that don't really evolve, right? Knowing that you want every patient to get the very highest quality care for the very lowest price, you know, that's kind of a true North that that's not going to change over time. We're never, I don't imagine there's ever going to come a day when we, when we say, you know, we ought to charge more money and provide lower quality care. That doesn't really make any sense. So you've got a true North that doesn't change how you achieve that true North might change. And I think that's where we see evolution in the delivery of healthcare in the United States. Fantastic. I love that. So you were obviously in a very large organization for a long time, um, even though maybe felt maybe more like a startup at some points when you came down here to South Florida, but you've definitely been what I would say is bit by the entrepreneurial bug in joining Hopco. Was there a moment you can point to that you remember feeling that urge? And, and I want to learn about the new organization. Tell us a little bit about um, sure. what, what the company's vision is, mission. You, you mentioned what, what its status is in the, in the nation, but I'm interested to know a little bit more about the vision long-term. 
Sure. So the, the vision is actually really pretty easy. I mean, it's to be the, the very best uh, musculoskeletal value-based management company in the world. And, and uh, I would tell you that we're achieving that. I mean, we're, we're, we're the largest here in the United States. We're, we, we are doubling literally every year. When I joined the company, uh, we had about 700 employees. That was two and a half years ago. Today, we have 4,500 employees. Wow. We, when I joined the company, we were in three states. Today, we're in 33 states. You know, the company is, has has really grown very quickly, but it's grown it's grown um, quickly, but prescriptively. You know, I think when you're a startup early on, you have to be very opportunistic in how you grow. Opportunities come to you. It might not be the perfect opportunity, but you execute on it because it's there and you want to keep growing. We've gotten to the point now where we're very selective about our growth. And I think, you know, that's a little bit of a luxurious position to be in. I mean, if you look at the biggest brands in healthcare today, Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic, they don't partner with everybody that comes around the corner. They're very selective in terms of who they partner with. And, and we're getting to that point today where we can be very selective about who we choose to partner with, whether it's on the practice side, the hospital side, the insurance side. Um, and I think that's very that, that's a very luxurious position to be in. Uh, and I give a lot of the credit for that to our founder and, and really to all the founders that started this company 18 years ago and candidly were ahead of their time. You know, when you think about the fact that it took 15 years to take the first state that Hopka was in Arizona and really truly quote market transform it. And we came to Florida three years ago and we've done the same thing in Florida in literally 20% of the time. And we're now doing that same thing in Nevada, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in New England, you know, as we continue Michigan, as we continue to grow. And each time we do it, we do it faster, we do it better. Uh, you know, our playbook gets more finely tuned. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it's been it's been absolutely exciting. You know, the entrepreneurial spirit has always been in me. Um, yeah, at the Cleveland Clinic, we were we were very forward leaning when it came to conflict of interest. And we were very transparent about conflict of interest. I think we were the first organization in the country that listed every doctor's conflict of interest on our website. And yours truly always had the most conflicts of anyone. So I, we were very transparent about it. We managed the conflict. Um, I did a lot of work with organizations outside of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and, and look, I think that that's actually, that's a great thing to do um, as long as you're transparent about it and you're very open about it. So that entrepreneurial bug had always been in me. Uh, and then when the opportunity came to, uh, to be a leader at what I felt was the best musculoskeletal management company in the country, it was uh, it was uh, pretty low hanging fruit to jump on that. I love that. Great insights. Much like Hopco, I came from Arizona to Florida. Got yeah. a lot better. Might have doubled in size too. Not sure, <laughs> but uh, that's amazing. That's a great story. I am going to continue to follow along with that, and I'm really excited to hear more because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the hiring. And so, this is an area that's obviously a big passion of mine. That's why we do this podcast. Our company has become embedded in the medical and healthcare community over the last four years working with leaders around APC shortages and finding the best clinicians and physicians out there. So this is an area that I'm really excited to dive into with you. And, and you've been in two different environments now, so I'm gonna, you're gonna have some really great perspective. So let's start here. Do you have an overall hiring philosophy for anybody that you bring into your organization? And I'll ask as an add-on, has that changed as you've gone from one organization to another? Yeah, you know, I, I do. Um, and I'll be very, you know, direct and, and open with you because some of the stuff may not be very positive. They have, may not be very popular, I should say, um, you know, especially after the COVID era with a lot of folks changing jobs quickly. Um, I don't hire folks that job jump. You know, if somebody's been in four jobs in the last five years, I don't even interview them. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to have some staying power. Sure. And, and a lot of folks will say, well, look, that isn't fair. COVID changed the world and stuff. I don't entirely buy that. You know, I, I think you've got to have some staying power. You've got to be willing to ride it out. You know, if you left voluntarily, you know, every year that's telling if somebody lets you go every year, that's telling. I, I want people that that have ridden out their jobs for a while and and have uh, and have been good at it. That's number one. Uh, number two, I think your leadership team has to be complementary, meaning 
if you're a, a high level strategic thinker um, and you don't really like to get in the weeds, then your, your, your partner, your dyad better be somebody that really gets in the weeds and is going to kind of follow some of your high level strategic thinking. Sure. There aren't that many people that are great at both. There are some, our CEO, David Jakovsky, he's, he's a bit of an exceptional guy in that he is both a very high level strategic thinker, but he's a very detail oriented. He's candidly the best, smartest healthcare business leader I've ever met in my life. I mean, the guy's wow. just absolutely brilliant. Uh, and he's a practicing musculoskeletal oncologist, Mayo Clinic, Hopkins trained. The guy's the real deal. Um, so, so people like like him are a little bit of a unicorn, you know. So I think as you as you hire and you build your team, you have to recognize what the team's present deficiencies are, and hire the very best person that you can find that helps to fill out what the team is lacking. Um, you know, from my perspective, that fits in very, very well to when you are when you start thinking about diversity and inclusion, right? Because the whole reason we start thinking about diversity and inclusion is because for decades, for centuries, the leadership of every company across the world were usually white males, right? So you only got one perspective. Now, all of a sudden you start thinking, well, maybe this isn't, what we need. We need a diverse leadership team in terms of, you know, the group that they're leading. Do they do they look like the people they're leading? Do they look like the community that they're leading in? Do they think the same way? That's how you build a world class company. It's not saying this is how we do it as white males and you need to do it the same way. It's not that at all. It's this is how we ought to do it. So as you start thinking about what's lacking in my leadership team, very frequently it may very much follow the exact same principles that we think about when we think about diversity and inclusion in leadership. Does your leadership team mirror the community that you're working in? Does your leadership team complement one another in terms of their different perspectives? Do they complement one another in terms of their ability to push back on each other and say, you know, I agree with you or I don't agree with you. And this is the reason I don't agree with you. And let me take a moment to try to convince you of my perspective in, in, in terms of why I think we should do things differently. So those are kind of some of the basic hiring philosophies that I have. Um, it really is around staying power and it really is around hiring the very best person that fills out what you're lacking in your present leadership team. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I love the thought on diversity from your leadership team perspective because so much you see diversity as a, as a box being checked, but really what we're thinking about is that outcome of, I have people in my organization that we need to mirror and understand their experience. And it's that diversity of thought, that diversity of, I grew up a different way. I experienced different things. I've seen things differently and thus can add perspective that will ultimately help us get where we want to go. I think that's incredible. I really love that. And I think your organization is better off for that mindset. Um, if I ask you to think about a memorable interview experience, maybe it's you interviewing or maybe you interviewed somebody else. Is there one that immediately comes to mind? <laughs> yeah, but but I but I think I got um, I think I got uh, schnookered in this one. So um, <laughs> I was uh, it was my very was is my first college job interview. So I'd already worked as a as a as a uh, nursing assistant in high school, and then after I finished uh, high school, my my first year of college that that summer between first and second year, I interviewed at Cutco. Um, you know, selling knives. Uh, it turned out I was pretty good at it, actually. But I remember <laughs> they brought in like 40 people and the guy doing the hiring sat there and and told us, um, you know, I'm only going to hire four of you. Uh, so we're going to go through this interview process. I, I need everybody to go out in the hall and bring people in one at a time and, uh, and we'll go through the process. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. After about five minutes, he came in, and he said, oh, I just got an emergency phone call. I have to leave. You're all hired. Now, at that time, I didn't really understand the pyramid scheme. <laughs> I shouldn't say scheme because it works and they sell a great product. But I have no doubt that the intention all along was to hire all 40 of us because all 40 of us made money for this guy. Uh, but but that really stands out in my mind um, as, a, as a moment where I just thought to myself, wow, I got so lucky that I got this job, just happened to get it today because I came in today. But the reality of it is, I think, just about 
um, everybody would have gotten that job. <laughs> That's truly <laughs> incredible. So I, I, I got to say, they definitely snookered you. That's amazing. They didn't yeah. want it to seem like that. They treated it like a Hunger Games type situation. Exactly. And they came back and hired y'all. Real cutting edge of Cutco over there with their, their hiring policies. I love that. Yeah. How long did you last there? Uh, well, it was a summer job. So I worked there through the summer. I sold a ton. I made a lot of like money. door to door? We're like knocking on doors? No, no, no. no. So, so the, the, the Cutco model is you call all your parents' friends. Got it. And you sell to them and then you ask them for their friends and you sell to their friends. So that oh, was the it's point. definitely a pyramid scheme. That, that that's network point. marketing right there. I love it. But that. I'll tell you what, it's a pyramid scheme that has a very high quality product. That's the reality. I have I actually bought Cutco knives for one of my friend's daughters because A, I wanted to support their daughter, but B, because they're the best knives I've ever owned. <laughs> I'm sold. I'm at give me a second. Let me uh, write down the link real quick. I'm gonna order some knives. I'll be right back. Uh, that's amazing. Well, so let me ask you, do you have a favorite question that you like to ask in your interviews? You know, I, I, uh, I, I don't really, I mean, usually when I'm going to interview somebody, I, I go through their CV and I'll ask them specific questions about their CV. So I'll give you an example. Um, I was a fellowship director at, up in Cleveland for our hip and knee replacement fellowship. And it was a okay. very, very competitive fellowship. Um, and, and sometimes people might inadvertently um, add things on their resume that they didn't really do quite as much of. So I, that, that would always kind of catch me a little bit, catch my eye if somebody's resume was really impressive. Um, and a lot of times you would see that in research, for example, they'd have a bunch of research projects and they would all say in progress, in progress, in progress, in progress, as opposed to a publication or an abstract that had been published and was already done. So whenever I saw that, I would I would lean into those questions. I would say, well, tell me about this project. You know, how did you guys do the power analysis? What's the question that you're trying to answer? And the reason was I wanted to know that they actually did it, that they that, that it wasn't, you know, um, just something that they added or an idea that they had. And because they thought of the idea and intended to do the project, they added it to the resume. You know, I wanted to know that it was a real project that was really done and they actually played a meaningful role in it. So I would dig into some of those things. So my interview style tends to be leaning in and digging in a little bit more than kind of the superficial, you know, what did you like? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Everybody asks those questions, right? But it was really to, to get a deeper understanding of what made this person tick and did they have that staying power? And were they willing to give that discretionary effort? Because something like research, for example, you know, the, the reward for that is your name on a paper. You know, it's and, and it's it's literally weeks and weeks and weeks worth of work, sometimes years worth of work to, to finish a research paper. Um, you know, some people might say, well, that isn't worth it. You know, that's an awful lot of work to just see your name, you know, on a in a paper, and that journal might have had 25 papers that you know that month. Um, so I wanted to know, did this person really make that discretionary effort? Did, are they really in it for the right reasons? I think that's really smart. I always advise people from an interview perspective to dive into the details of the resume of the things that they're talking about that they did. It reminds me that I did a podcast with the CEO of Blaze Pizza a little while ago, and she was telling me that one of the interviews that somebody claimed to have invented Alexa. Uh, and it turns out that they were very, very, uh, you know, adjacent to, to, to anything that came out in terms of Alexa. Um, but she wouldn't have known that if she wouldn't have gotten the detail in the interview. And so it's really important to. I was going to say, was it Al Gore? Oh, no, no. He invented. He invented the, the internet. internet. That's Big right. difference. Different. Okay. He that's might have gotten different. Alexa, though, too. We need to check in. We haven't checked in with Al in a little while. Um, so that's hilarious. And I think that's a really smart way to go about it. Now, let me flip it on you. If so, Is there anything that you're looking for? Because obviously, at the end, we always ask, do you have any questions for me? Yeah. What would stand out to you, impress you in terms of a question that maybe you're asked? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I want people to ask about what's what's the vision of the organization? Where are we going? Where do you see the organization in five years? How do I grow in this organization? Right. I mean, somebody that's that just asking me, well, can you go over the benefits package or how much vacation time do I get? You know, that to me tells me this is going to be a job, not a career. You know, somebody that's asking, how do I grow in this organization is thinking about a long term career with us. I like that. You know, I'm not looking for a two year hire or a four year hire. I'm looking for a lifetime hire, you know, somebody that's going to drink the Kool-Aid and be here for a long time to make it to be part of the success. Yep. Jackie, you hear that? I asked the vision of Hopco earlier. So I think me and Will are hearing it off. That's the type of question. <laughs> like, so that's good. 
And I'm, I'm the same way. We tell people here that come to MSH all the time. We offer careers, not jobs. If you're looking for jobs, there are plenty of companies that are offering out there. And I have no ill will for anybody who wants that with their life. But if you're coming here to do something purposeful and meaningful and you care about your work and work is part of your identity, then this place can be super, super rewarding. So I love that. I think that's a very smart thing. Now, listen, we all miss when it comes to hiring. Um, you know, from time to time, we'll look back and say, God, I wish I would have done this. I'm interested if you miss, when you miss on anybody, is there something that you look back as a theme that you maybe you, you wish you would have asked yeah. or you wish you would have followed up on? Yeah, look, I, I have one miss that definitely stands out in my head. Um, I won't go into too much detail because th this person, you know, may end up hearing this one day. I don't want their feelings to be hurt. You know, you got to it, it was against my better judgment. Um, I hired somebody because they had a very, very deep knowledge base in an area that we needed that knowledge base for, but they had jumped several jobs. They, this was like the fourth job in maybe five years for them, maybe six years now that I think about it. Same title as all the other ones. So this job was no different than any other, but they had a deep level of, of market knowledge. They had a deep level of, um, of, of kind of core knowledge to this, to this specific field. And I, and I hired them. Um, it worked out great for 12 months. The following six months were not great. You know, I could tell that they were getting kind of disengaged. Um, they weren't, they were asking other people to do the work for them. Hmm. Uh, and then came to me and said, look, this, this doesn't seem to be working out. Why don't we discuss a, uh, uh, you know, some kind of a settlement. I'll just leave. You guys pay me. And I said, well, why, why would we pay you if you're the one that wants to leave? That's, it's really not the way that this works. Um, so, you know, in the end they left, we didn't pay them. Um, and it was, it was clearly a miss. And that, that, that's kind of the reason why I've kind of doubled down on this thought process around, you know, being careful with that staying power. You know, every company has good quarters and bad quarters, you know, n nobody has an unlimited you know, upward trajectory. None of the best companies in the world have that. If you look at Apple, if you look at Google, if you look at Facebook, yeah, Meta now today, right? They've they've all gone through challenging times. Um, do you have the ability to ride that through? Do you have the, the confidence in your product that it's gonna turn around and that you're not gonna just walk away as soon as it gets a little tough? And by the way, it's the same thing if I'm your boss and I have a, you know, maybe a critical conversation with you about something, is that going to really upset you and you're going to quit? Or are you going to take it as an opportunity to be better and stay and double down and do a better job the next time, right? Those are all our things that I think that flow together in terms of, of, of um, that staying power. Yeah. So listen, I know you said it's not a popular answer. Uh, here's what I would say. And, and and I agree with you on, on, on the vast majority of what you're saying for this reason, right? If you're constantly having to explain why something didn't work out multiple times, then the issue is probably not all of those companies, those bosses, those things, right? It probably has something to do with you. And to your point, it's also a sign of, especially if you're the one leaving, right? That adversity is going to come up in every job, every relationship, everything that we have, right? Um, and your ability to fight through it, stick through it, like you said, if you have something you don't like that you heard, like you don't want somebody that's going to wilt up. You'd rather have somebody that's going to come back and say, hey, I want to talk about that or I want to challenge that in an appropriate form. So I'm 100 percent with you on that. And listen, what we're doing, we're trying to all try to do our best in terms of hiring. And At the end of the day, we got to know where we spend our expend our energy and we've got to make educated guesses on what we think is going to be the best use of our time. And so I think that there might be some people out there that have a few roles in four years that it's certainly explainable and understandable, but the vast majority of the, the people, 98%, 99%, it's not, it's not. And you'll find that out even after you, they, they might seem great, but you find that out probably in time. And so I think my take on this would be technology can help enable this a lot, right? If there's a way to, um, get to the bottom of it quicker and understand. I think that's a great thing, but I also agree with you. I mean, we've seen it here too, right? We have a lot of clients that say, if somebody's had this amount of jobs in this amount of time, that's not going to be a fit for us. More often than not, that's right. So I don't fault you at all for that. I think it's probably worked well for you. And I think there might be some people in the past that um, might've gotten away because there's something explainable about it, but more often than not, um, I don't think that's the case. And so I think you're doing the right thing with that. And I, I recommend it. If you're the constant, right, and everything else is very well, all these different jobs, and you're the constant, 
Yeah. That's what, I'll tell you one other major turnoff for me is if during an interview, somebody talks negatively about their last job. Yep. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, this is just a piece of advice for folks, right? You can just say, you know, we, we didn't entirely agree on things. You know, I was ready to move on. It was a, I wanted to move on, you know, on in terms of my own personal career growth. There are things that you can say that are not negative towards your prior, your prior employer, because many times if it's in the same field, chances are I know somebody at that employer. And I yep. probably know that it's a pretty good company right? That, that you chose to leave, which is fine. Um, but then, you know, don't smear them in the process that, that you never look good making somebody else look bad. There's no upside there, right? It, it's always can be, it can be a fit issue that happens. Things don't always work out. I think that's okay. I think being as transparent about that uh, and not working out is great. But like you said, smearing, it. it's like, you know, an ex-girlfriend smearing an ex-boyfriend, or it's like any of those types of situations where what is the benefit of you running them through the mud, even if things didn't work out, because there's always two sides. There's always a different perspective and they probably have a different story themselves. So I'm totally agree with you. That's a big red flag. And I think most people get that, but I've definitely seen some situations where that's not the case. So I think it's a good call out by you. Last thing I'd ask is in terms of creating a positive candidate experience, when people come in to interview for Hopco, how do you give them a realistic job preview of what to expect, what the company's about? Do you do anything in the interview process to kind of align that? Or is that something that they typically find out day one, day two? Yeah, I, look, so so I would say um, it's a little bit of both. Um, our interview process is usually fairly concise. It's and it's intentionally that way. We'll bring somebody in, and and within a day or two, they've met maybe ten of the major leaders in the organization. Uh, they've been able to ask all of their questions. We want them to be kind of fully. Uh, embedded in that interview process. Uh, we, we don't drag it out. We don't have you come back five times over, you know, 10 weeks. I've always found that to be a crazy interview process and, sure. and it happens, you know, yep. um, it happens a lot, especially in healthcare. We don't do that. We we want to get people in, decision made, move on. So that that's number one. We're very honest in our process. We tell folks, everybody here works hard. You're expected to work hard. Uh, but you're rewarded well. I mean, it, it's a very entrepreneurial place. So so there, there's real upside for, for most of our executives if, if, in fact, the company does well. And I think that's meaningful. Um, there are bonuses in place, you know, for, for folks when the company does well. So we do reward people with that. And we tell them that. Um, so I, I think that's helpful. And then when the job starts, we try to make it special for folks, you know, whether it's, you know, balloons on their first day, a cake, you know, something special to make them recognize that we're grateful for the fact that they chose to come and work with us, that they're, that they're part of this team. Uh, and I, I think you have to do that. I think every, it's easier, obviously, when you're small, it gets progressively harder as you get bigger because organizations by nature become a little more impersonal um, as you get bigger, but they don't have to be impersonal at your kind of within your department, right? So your manager, your your director, the assistant manager in your group, you know, we empower them to do things. So if, if one of our managers wants to take their team out to lunch, you know, to thank them for a great, you know, a great month, by all means, take them to lunch. Nobody's going to question you turning in a receipt for 150 bucks worth of pizza, you know, and it's silly when people do that. So, allowing you know training your your frontline leaders and empowering them to create a special environment for everybody that works there i think is important and you know unfortunately i think as organizations get bigger that sometimes falls by the wayside you know you start trying to institutionalize what's when is it okay to take a group out for a pizza lunch you know, do, do we really need to do that i mean do we really I mean, if you can't trust your managers to make that decision, you've probably not hired the right people or you've not trained them the right way. 100%. 100%. I think the key there is that, and people have asked me before, how does culture scale? How do these things that keep you special when you're 100 matter when you're 1,000? I think the key is it's management. It's your managers have to be avatars, brand representatives, cultural zealots, right? Standard throughout the organization. And they have to be trained on that. They have to be given the tools for that. They have to be empowered to do that. 
And you, you're right, like in healthcare in particular, there can be a lot of bureaucracy around things like that. And I think we have to hire adults, treat them like adults. And if you didn't, you're exactly right. Did we hire the right person, right? Or are we managing and training them effectively if we're worried about these decisions? So I think you're spot on with that. I think that's fantastic. And, and I want to look at the other side of it is you got to hold them accountable, sure. right? I mean, that's the other thing, right? You can't set a goal and miss the goal and reward everybody. Yep. You know, accountability is, is an absolute um, foundational principle in any organization for it to be successful. 100%. I could not agree with you more. Um, so I want to ask you, you're the chief transformation officer at Hopco. It's a company that you said has been doubling year over year. Can you tell us a little bit about what the scope of your role entails? What are you, what, what's your definition of success in this role as a chief transformation officer? Yeah, I'll, t- I'll tell you a funny story. So my first day at work, um, I, I just, just started, I flew out to Phoenix where um, our, our West side our, our, our kind of Western United States headquarters is that's that's really kind of the the uh, the, the biggest part of the company um, is out is out in Phoenix, and I met with uh, with David Jakovsky, our our CEO, and Jason Scalise, who is our chief uh, growth officer. And Jason was so funny. We had we had just gotten a little tidbit of of bad news that day. It was my first day, and Jason looked at me. He goes, "You better go transform something." <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the whole idea around th- this title, and we're starting to see it more and more in healthcare, is how do we shift our thought processes in healthcare delivery from volume-based care to value-based care? How does that? How do we transform that? So much of the work that we do in markets, we call market transformation. It's it's how do you work with a healthcare system to get them to start thinking about the highest quality care at the lowest quality at the lowest cost site even if that site is not your hospital maybe that site is a surgery center maybe that site is a subacute nursing facility maybe that site is home care maybe that site is an app on your phone that allows you to do physical therapy but right? how do we start transforming the market how do we get practices providers to start thinking differently about how they deliver healthcare Right. Can we standardize the injectables that we're using? Can we standardize the clinical care path so every patient is getting the same care, regardless of whether they're seeing if it's shoulder pain, if they're seeing a physiatrist, a primary care sports medicine doctor, their primary care doctor, a world famous orthopedic surgeon? Doesn't matter, right? If it's first time shoulder pain, the care for that ought to be relatively standardized. So, how do we transform our thought processes to make them more? science-based and less art-based, right? Healthcare really shouldn't be an art. Healthcare should be a science. And I think we're, we're slowly evolving and transforming our healthcare system in the United States and taking out some of the art and introducing more of the science and transforming our system to be a little bit more standardized. And then finally, working with insurance companies to say, look, if we can help you provide your clients, your patients with a higher quality of care for a lower cost, and, the, and those decisions that are leading to higher quality care and lower costs are emanating from the providers. Can we reward the providers in a compliant way for that thought process and for the fact that they're making the effort to work with you on standardizing care and, and reducing variability and, and, and reducing cost? So those are really the things that we think about when it comes to, to transformation. So, so to answer more directly, the areas that report to me in the company are the MSO arm, which is the the arm that manages our orthopedic practices, our musculoskeletal practices, some of them are pain management, you know, their uh, uh, neurosurgical spine, all of these things. The second is the arm that works with healthcare systems to uh, manage musculoskeletal service lines in their healthcare systems. And then the third is the value-based care arm, which works with insurance companies to actually design and roll out value-based products to improve the quality of care and reduce the cost of care. So that's that's kind of what the Office of Transformation manages. But I will tell you at, at Hopco, I mean, it, it kind of sounds like it's three verticals, but these three verticals are all completely intertwined. They're part of a, they're three pieces of a puzzle that fit together that are all um, uh, truly foundationed upon a very robust uh, digital platform that allows us to deliver this high quality consistent outcome, lower cost level of care that delights patients, that that saves money and improves quality. 
Yeah, there's something you said there that really hit home to me. And, and obviously, we're in very different worlds. But what we are doing here at MSH from a hiring perspective is changing it from an art to a science. And you know, if you have that gut intuition on somebody, let's dig into that gut. What does that come from, from your experience, your preferences, your biases, right? What, how do we codify that from a behavioral perspective? How do we, will you really get along with somebody? What are the actual inputs and outputs that determine that driving standard in that space? So that totally hits close to me, obviously two very different worlds, but something for so long that's been seen as this, like, I'm just great at hiring because I know what I'm looking for, actually codifying that and systematizing that and then democratizing that for everybody is what our mission here is at our company. And so really at home, I love that. Um, I mean, if, you, if you look at healthcare today, I mean, more and more of what we're doing is around predictive modeling and artificial intelligence. That's exactly what you just described, right? It's taking, how do you take a clinician's gestalt, right? I might see a patient and, and, and know, yeah, this patient's going to struggle after their knee replacement. I, I can tell, you know, when I'm examining them, they're, you know, I push on the, everything hurts. Um, their pain is not consistent with their physical findings or with their, their imaging. You know, I can tell that patient's not going to do really well. They're going to recover more slowly. So how do you take that gestalt and make it objective so that every single person that sees that patient knows that they're going to struggle a little bit? And it's not to say that the patient still shouldn't get a knee replacement. It just means you need to talk to the patient and explain to them your recovery is likely going to be longer. Don't compare yourself to your neighbors when they got a knee replacement. You're gonna to have to work a little harder with your physical therapy than other people have to work with their physical therapy. So that whole idea of introducing more artificial intelligence, predictive modeling into the delivery of healthcare is, is really in many ways what allows us to be more consistent in the outcomes that we're getting. I don't know if people are listening to this and seeing the, the vision of what you're saying and how I translate that into my world, but that's what we've offered for so many for 12 plus years as a services business. And it's what we're building into our software Aon, because there are factors that lead to predictive fit within a company. And we leverage artificial intelligence, right? Along with some of that human intuition to make judgments so that when we hire somebody, they're not leaving in under a year, that they're getting promoted, that they are great fits within the teams and all the different stakeholders. And so I love that. And, and, and that's where our world is moving. That's where people get afraid of artificial intelligence. They get afraid of technology. But I'm well-branded as a technology optimist, and I believe that this is going to change jobs fundamentally, but make us better at what we do and transform the way that we work. Um, and, and for the healthcare space, there's it's just such a realm of vastness and, and incredibleness and so much more impact in terms of lives on the line. So I love it. I, I really love it. I could pick your brain on this all day. I got to ask you, is there anything right now you're working on that you're super juiced about? Is there any kind of like objective or program or something that you're spearheading or that's going on in the company that you get up in the morning, you're really excited about. Yeah. There's, so there's a few. So, you know, one thing that that's different about us than, than other uh, musculoskeletal management companies is when we, when we enter a market, we consider the entire state, our, um, our market in essence, right? It's not the city of Jacksonville or the city of Fort Lauderdale. It's the state of Florida. That's how we think. So we are right now in the process of, of really doing some pretty major things, you know, where we've entered a state with a single platform and we're now expanding across the entire state. That's exciting. Second thing that's very exciting to me is we've started doing some work with the NHS in England to help them with, uh, with, with standardizing clinical care paths, maybe even helping them uh, in reducing some of their wait lists for total joint replacements. Um, so that that's extremely exciting to me to be able to, you know, enter a whole new, not just a new market, but a new country. Um, our digital platform is already, you know, used there very frequently, but being able to expand beyond that digital platform into bricks and mortar, I think is really, really exciting to me and, and totally jazzes me up. I love that. I love that. All right. Last question for me. Okay. Or for you. <laughs> If we were going to amplify one nugget of career advice that maybe you didn't have early on in your career, but that, that you know now, maybe for some of our early in career listeners, what would that be? Yeah, I'll tell you, it's, um, it's easy for me. It's uh, enjoy the ride, right? As you're starting your career, right? Whether you're finishing high school, finishing college, if you've, if you've gone to trade school, if you've done a, um, an internship with somebody, you know, you're going to become an electrician, you're going to become a salesperson, you're going to medical school and you're starting your first job, you're, um, you're going to be an entrepreneur, whatever it is. You know, we spend a lot of time 
sometimes being worried about that next stage in life, right? What, what's going to come next? I still think about what comes next, not necessarily what comes after Hopko, but what comes next for Hopko. And when we do that all the time, you sometimes lose sight of all the great things that you get that you can experience in the present. So to some degree, have a clear vision for where you want to be, but live in the present to some degree, right? Uh, and, and I think, you know, just when I think back to my days in college, you know, for me, high school was, was prep for college. Um, I played sports. I had a lot of fun. College was prep for medical school. Medical school was, you know, work really, really hard so that you get the right residency. Residency was work really, really hard so that maybe you get a job back here at the Cleveland Clinic or you get the fellowship that you want. But when I look back today, you know, college was one of the best times of my life. Residency was one of the best times of my life. You know, did I really get to enjoy it as much as I should have had I known that everything's going to be okay, right? You're going to you're going to achieve what you want to achieve. So enjoy the ride getting there. And that's something that I have really on a personal level have started incorporating more and more in my own life to try to enjoy the ride. I love that. It's such great advice. I've had a lot of people, you know, I think I'm a lot of the, the ha- one of the happiest people most people know. And it's because of this philosophy that you're talking about. And it's that I don't believe that fulfillment and ambition are mutually exclusive. The way I look at it is I have a growth mindset. So as long as I'm getting better every day, as long as our company is learning and getting better every day, and that doesn't mean we always have better results, but as long as it's growing and we're, we have that growth mindset, then I'm okay looking at today and being satisfied and fulfilled and looking around and saying, wow, this is a lot to accomplish at the ripe old age of 41. But if I'm in this same place next month or next year, then I have, I've, I've done a disservice to myself. And so I keep that ambition, but also I'm very grateful and feel very blessed for what I've been able to do, what I have, the things that are around me. And I think it's such great advice because if you're constantly just looking to what's next, you're going to turn around one day and look back and be like, what? I didn't, I didn't get as much enjoyment or fulfillment out of that as I should have. And that's a shame because you know, we're all going to die one day. I don't want to break any news for anybody. And so at some point you've got to be able to feel good about where you are and stop and smell those, those, those figurative roses. But also I think be keeping your eye on where you want to keep going and where that growth is going to come from. And again, I don't think that has to be mutually exclusive. They say a lot of times, you know, people who are, you know, stop being ambitious or getting fat and happy and, and, and fat, lazy on the farm or whatever they say. And I don't think that has to be the case. I'm going to keep my ambition and so hopefully I'm 70, 80, 90 years old, whatever it may be, but I'm also going to be present and in the moment. And I think that leads to more fulfilling outcomes and more fulfilling life. I think that's great advice, Will. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate you being here. Uh, local South Florida resident. I'd love to get together at some point soon. And thank you so much for coming on the episode. Thank you. I'd love to see you anytime. Yeah, just, just let me know and uh, we'll grab a drink, grab dinner. I, I really look forward to it. Thank you for having me. Talk to you soon, Will. Well.